Lesson 3 On the Conscience When God created man, he sowed something divine within him, a certain kind of reason, warm and bright, illuminating his news, and showing him how to distinguish between good and evil. This is called conscience, and is the natural law. It is the wells dug by Jacob, as our father said, and which the Philistines filled with earth. The patriarchs and all the saints followed the law, that is the law of conscience, before the written law was given, and they were pleasing to God. However, since natural law was buried in the ground and trampled upon by men through the advance of sin, we needed the written law, the holy prophets, and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All this in order to rediscover it and rebuild it, to reignite that spark which was under the soil by keeping his holy commandments. It is up to us now either to bury our conscience under the ground or to have it shine forth and illuminate us if we obey it. When our conscience says to us, do this, and we treat it with contempt, or it says it again and we refuse, then we are trembling it down, burying it underground. Thus, it cannot speak to us clearly because of the weight upon it. But like a lamp that only sheds a dim light, so the conscience gradually starts to show things more darkly and more obscurely. Thus, just as you cannot see your reflection in water muddied by dirt, so we also gradually find ourselves unaware of what our conscience is telling us, and even think that it hardly exists at all. However, nobody is without one, since, as we have said, it is something divine and is never lost but always reminds us what we should do. Nevertheless, as I said, we are unaware of it because we treat it with contempt. This is why the prophet mourns for Ephraim and says, Ephraim altogether prevailed against his adversary. He trod judgment underfoot. Adversary means the conscience. This is why the gospel says, Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you are thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Why then does he call the conscience adversary? It is called adversary because it is always opposed to our ill will and censures us for not doing what we ought to have done and doing what we ought not to do. Therefore it is called adversary and we are commanded to agree with our adversary quickly while we are still on the way with him. The way, as St. Basil says, is Brethren, let us therefore try to guard our conscience while we are in the world, without provoking it to censure us about anything, without trampling upon it in any way, even over something insignificant, since you know that from those small things we also come to despise the great ones. When somebody begins to say, what does it matter if I say that word? What does it matter if I eat that little thing? What does it matter if I pay attention to that? From the what does it matter for this and what does it matter for that, one obtains the bad and malignant sore and starts to despise and trample upon one's own conscience in great and important matters. Thus, progressively one is in danger of falling into total insensibility. Therefore, brethren, be careful not to neglect the small things, Take care not to despise them as something insignificant. They are not insignificant. They are cancer for the soul, a bad habit. Let us therefore be vigilant. Let us pay attention to slight things, whilst they are still slight, and before they become serious. 
both the life of holiness and the sinful life start from little things and lead to greater ones, either good or bad. This is why our Lord commanded us to keep our conscience as if he wanted to make somebody more careful by saying, See what you are doing, you poor man. Wake up, agree with your adversary whilst you are on the road with him. He points out the fear and the danger of this by saying, Lest at any time he deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast in prison. And why? Truly, as I say unto you, you shall by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. The conscience, as I said, examines us for the good and the bad as well, and shows us what we should do and what we should not do, and will accuse us again in our future life. This is why it says, lest at any time he deliver you to the judge, and so on. The guarding of a conscience takes on many forms. Everybody should act according to his conscience towards God, towards his neighbor and towards material things. He has to act according to his conscience in order not to disdain his commandments. Even in those things where nobody sees him and where no one demands anything. In fact, he himself takes care of his conscience towards God secretly. I shall explain what I mean by this. Somebody neglected prayer, a passionate thought arose within his heart, and he was vigilant. He did not restrain himself, but consented to it. He saw his neighbor saying something or doing something, and was suspicious and blamed him. In short, we should also keep our conscience vigilant in secret actions that nobody witnesses but for God and our conscience. This is precisely what is meant by guarding our conscience before God. The guarding of a conscience with regard to one's neighbor is doing absolutely nothing at all that we know will upset or wound him, either by deed, word, gesture, or even with a glance. Even a gesture, as I always say, can wound one's neighbor. Briefly, Man infects his conscience by deliberately doing those things that he knows will provoke his neighbor and will harm and embarrass him. Therefore, to keep one's conscience and not act in this manner is what we mean by keeping our conscience towards our neighbor. To act according to conscience in material things is when somebody does not misuse anything when he does not allow anything to be destroyed or thrown away, but if he sees something discarded, he does not leave it there, even if it is worthless, but picks it up and puts it in its place. It is also not using his clothes carelessly. Let us suppose that one can wear one's clothes for another one or two more weeks, goes to wash them earlier than necessary so they are worn out. Thus, Instead of using them for five months or more, they are ruined by washing and rewashing and rendered useless. This is against the conscience. The same thing happens with mattresses. Often somebody can accommodate himself with just a blanket, but he asks for a large mattress. He has one of goat's hair, but he wants to change it for another one or for a new or beautiful one, either out of pretension or from despondency. He can be satisfied with a rag covering, but he asks for a new woolen one, and he argues if he is not given it. It is also contrary to the conscience when somebody begins to pay attention to his brother, saying, Why does he have this and I do not? He is blessed. Indeed, it is progress to have better possessions than another. Again, somebody hangs out his clothes or bed covers under the sun, forgets to bring them back and leaves them to be burned. This is also against the conscience. It is the same with food. One can be satisfied with just a cabbage, pulses or olives, but one does not accept this and asks for richer and tastier food.
All this is once again opposed to the conscience. Our fathers say that the monk should not allow his conscience to make him remorseful about anything. Therefore, brethren, we must always be vigilant and keep ourselves free from all this, so as not to fall into danger. As we have already mentioned, the Lord himself testified to this too. God grant us to hear and observe all this, lest the word of our fathers be used in the day of judgment against us. For to him belong glory and domination to the ages of ages. Amen.